Well, good morning, Cowboys for Jesus. We're going to get started. The red light came on on the camera, so we're on the internet. Are you ready to start praising the Lord? Good morning, Jesus. I am so happy. It's going to be a wonderful day. I feel like shouting, sweet hallelujah. It's going to be a wonderful day. Woke up this morning, I felt like dancing. Cause there was so much to do, so much to see, so much to say. But before I started my wonderful morning, I got down on my knees and I began to pray. Good morning, Jesus. I am so happy. It's gonna be a wonderful day. I feel like shouting, sweet hallelujah. It's gonna be a wonderful day. Good morning, Jesus. I am so happy. It's gonna be a wonderful day. I feel like shouting, sweet hallelujah. It's gonna be a wonderful day. I feel like shouting, sweet hallelujah, it's gonna be a wonderful day, it's gonna be a wonderful day. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let's pray and ask God to show up and ask him to bless us with our socks off, okay? So, Father, we just thank you for the day. We thank you for your love, for your mercy, Father. We thank you for Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for a beautiful day, and, and, and we just ask you to pour your spirit out today, Father. We ask you just to put a quadruple anointing on, on Pastor Jimmy this morning as he brings the message. And, and, Lord, thank you for our faithful worship team. And we got some of them missing today, but these are going to sound like a a huge band back here, Father, and they're going to sing, and we're going to worship you, and it's all going to be good. And we thank you for faithful people, Father. But, Lord, bless us today with your presence, and let us know when we leave this place that we've been in your presence, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to start with an easy song just to get us going. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh yeah, Jesus gave me the light. I'm gonna let it shine. Jesus gave me the life. I'm gonna let it shine. Jesus gave me the light. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh yeah, won't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, oh yeah. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, oh yeah. Gonna let it shine till Jesus comes. I'm gonna let it shine, gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, 
Let's pray over our offering. Father, we just thank you for, for all you're doing today, Lord. We just thank you for the offering. We ask you to help us to be good stewards. And Father, just uh, just watch over us today and, uh, and, and let everything go smooth and, and let everything work right today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't we stand so we can get some blood flowing in us. I can... I think we have the Christmas blues, which we shouldn't have Christmas blues. We should have Christmas praise. Amen. Build your house on the rock. Build your house on the rock. Build your house on the rock and it shall stand. There's no power on this earth that can stand against God's word. To build your house on the rock and it shall stand. Be a doer of the word and you'll be blessed. In your faith you can take your rest. If you only choose to hear, you won't be going anywhere. But if you know that you can do anything that Christ who strengthened you, you'll be believing and you won't be dragging behind. Build your house on the rock. Build your house on the rock. Build your house on the rock. Stand. There's no power on this earth that can stand against God's word to build your house on the rock and it shall stand. But there's nothing in the world that'll hold you back. God didn't give you the spirit of that. The Bible says all things are yours, so take it or leave it, it's your choice. But as for me, me and mine, we're gonna walk that narrow line. Be a receiver, we'll be receiving God's best. Build your house on the rock, build your house on the rock, build your house on the rock, and it shall stand. There's no power on this earth that can stand against God's word. Build your house on the rock, and it shall stand. There's no power on this earth. Build your house on the rock and it shall stand. Hallelujah. Okay, we all know this one. He's got the whole world.
really glad that he does. The splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice Trembles at his voice
But I believe it's time for, if you have a word for the Lord, Pastor Jimmy will be up front and you can come and, and give a word that he has put upon your heart. So as we play that song again, um, Pastor Jerry, did you? As we sing the song again, just ask him. Ask him if there's something that you need to share with the body. And let's just worship him. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. promise is always that I'll be with you always but I love to feel him I love to feel his presence ask the Lord this morning to let you feel him you know I, I was uh, I had a unique experience this week 
uh, my son and grandson and I were duck hunting and they were in the blind and I was over behind the dam out of the wind and uh, the uh, I just lay in there against that dam me and my dog and I, I began to reflect back from when I was a little boy about 11 years old laying on the ground shooting the buzzards with the 22 and hunting by myself and how, the, how much I enjoyed that and, and I just began to feel a, a high and the Lord reminded me there are three kinds of high there's a chemical high that people get when they take drugs it's, it's, it's cheap there's a natural high that comes from the natural world as we experience his creation and just enjoy that but there is a spiritual high in the Holy Spirit and it's beyond all of the highs and so just ask him to let you feel him this morning feel his presence Barbara sing that again praise God let's just, let's just feel him this morning Before you come, God, have you got a word that you'd like for me to give to your body this morning? And uh, let's remember to do that, okay? We should come prepared. There comes Roger. Roger's always there. This is a faithful man. Well, I'm not sure if mine's a word or it's more testimony I guess I was going out to Throckmorton for Christmas with my son and grandkids and uh, <laughs> boy that devil was we, we had a battle I'll tell you um, I pick up about halfway there it went to uh, spitting and sputtering and carrying on I pulled over to the side my hood doesn't stay up. I got to prop it up with a stick. The wind was blowing so hard it kept blowing my stick out and my hood kept trying to come down on my head. So uh, I was getting a little aggravated. Couldn't figure out what in the world it could be because I couldn't really get to see anything from fighting that. Well, about 10 miles up the road there, there was a picnic area. So I pulled in there and turned around where the wind would be pushing against my stick and held my, hold my hood up. And I, I was like, God, you know, <laughs> I'm, I need to get to Throckmorton. Do I need to go back home? Where do I need to go with this? Because I was at my rope thin. Just gave it to him. And uh, he told me to get under the hood there again. And I could see some tape on some wires that was fluttering. I was like, that don't look right. So I was gassing it with the throttle outside there and it just really blow it. And it, it, what it was, that the boot on my plug wire had come, gotten hot or something sometime or another. Anyway, it blowed the top of my spark plug off and it was just hanging in that boot and I couldn't get it out. And it was sparking fire and whatnot. Well, I had a, some plugs in the back there from when I changed them out and I got one of them. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I can get the rest of this plug out. Well, it was just turning. It wasn't doing nothing. I couldn't get on it. So I put a, another extension that I had that had a wobble joint with it. The Lord told me to use that one. I got it and I stuck it on there and I was just pushing and turning. And I was ready to give up and it started coming loose. Well, I got the plug out and got that one in, got it on into town. 
went to the parts house. They didn't have no plug wires. There was one more parts house, and I was able to get a plug wire for it. And I'm sitting there fighting it, trying to get all this changed out. And the guy comes out from the store and says, you got a flat on the rear back there. Well, now then, I'm, I'm really getting a little, little at that point. And I'm just asking God, I'm already repenting because I know what's coming, you know. <laughs> and uh, he said, no, no, we can do this. But anyway... I got the spare changed and everything and was having difficulties with it, that little screw jack and me trying to crawl under there and get up and get down. A young guy came by to pick up and uh, he said, sir, you need help? I said, I need all the help I can get. <laughs> and he was able to get that tire for me, get it on there. And uh, anyway, I feel like that God sent him along at that time when I needed it the most. I gave him, I tried to give him some money. He said, no, no. And I said, yeah. So I gave him some money anyway and told him nothing else to get you a hamburger. And he thanked me and he said, this is exactly what I needed. <laughs> this was Christmas Eve and he was wanting to get his sister a present. There you go. God works in wonderful ways, right? And we all learn. How many of y'all glad you came to church today? Amen. Amen. All right. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. team. These holidays are about over, Barbara. We hope you get your whole team back real soon. It'll be good.
Lacey, you should bring your mother and all your brothers. It fills up two rows. We miss them. It's always good to see them here. Praise God. Amen. Well, Brother Jerry did his best to twist your arm to come to the talent show New Year's Eve, and we hope it did some good, but let me try to motivate you another way. Miss Beth says she's going to make a great big Cajun duck sausage and chicken gumbo. So if you want to eat something, come on. We'll have, we'll have a duck gumbo Thursday night. Praise the Lord. Uh-huh. You got to perform before you eat. Yeah. <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. Well, if we thank you, Father, now for the Holy Spirit who will help us, Lord, we thank you, you help us to worship. We can't worship without the help of the Holy Spirit. We can't teach the Bible without the help of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we can't really walk the Jesus life without the help of the Holy Spirit. And so we ask God that you'll help us and help us today teaching the Word and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, several weeks ago, I began speaking on the subject of the covenants of the Bible. And <clears throat> spoke about blood covenant, the first one, when I told the story of Mephibosheth, the crippled son of Jonathan, who was hiding in a desert, thinking King David wanted to kill him, not knowing that his father Jonathan had cut covenant with, king, with David long before he was king, back when they were teenagers, they had cut covenant, and that covenant included not just themselves, but it included all of their descendants, all of their seed. And so Mephibosheth was the recipient of a wonderful blood covenant where everything was restored back to him that was lost when his father and his grandfather fell. But he didn't know it. He didn't know about that covenant. And so uh, <clears throat> that's a beautiful, beautiful picture of blood covenant. You remember when they would cut the animal, the animal around through the skull, the backbone, lay the halves over against each other, walk through the pathway, making vows, covenant vows to one another. And uh, uh, many of you have read my little book called Am I a Dead Dog? It is the story of Mephibosheth. It's written in the first person singular like I am Mephibosheth. And if you read that little book, I promise you, you will know something about Blood Covenant. It's a, it's a biblical novel that I wrote and it teaches uh, detail of Blood Covenant. And then we looked recently at Salt Covenant. There's three kinds of covenants in the Bible. Blood Covenant, Salt Covenant, Shoe Covenant. We looked at the salt covenant, and God, and as we looked at the salt covenant, we looked at the Davidic covenant. The covenant that God made with David is a covenant of salt, and salt is a picture of loyalty and commitment and faithfulness in the Bible. And so God says to David, I am making a salt covenant with you that one of your descendants shall always sit upon the throne of David. And praise God, the day is coming when his descendant, the Lord Jesus, the son of David, will sit on David's throne in Jerusalem and reign over the nation of Israel and the nations of the earth. Praise God. That'll be the, the ultimate fulfillment of the Davidic covenant or the salt covenant. So it's blood covenant, salt covenant, and then there is the shoe covenant. We're going to look at the shoe covenant today. And the shoe covenant has to do with redemption. Now under Hebrew law, three things can be redeemed. Widows, slaves, and property. If a man died and had no children, his wife now is a widow, and the plight of widows in ancient days was, was, was terrible. They had no protector, they had no provider. And some of them had to turn to prostitution, some of them turned to begging. It was, it was a terrible plight to be a widow. And so the Bible said that if a man died and he had no children, then his brother is to take his wife, raise up children from her so that the man's name would not be forgotten in the earth. So the, the redemption of widows. And then slaves. Slaves could be redeemed. If a man got into financial difficulty, he could sell himself to another Hebrew. He was not to sell himself to a Gentile, an outsider. But he could sell himself to another Hebrew. And he would serve that man as his slave. Technically, he's not a slave. He's what we would call an indentured servant because... After six years, in the seventh year, the man is to go free. But during that six years that he's in slavery, one of his near kinsmen, a relative, a brother, whatever, can come and redeem him out of slavery 
and set him free. And then third, property could be redeemed. If a man got into financial difficulty and uh, what is left to do? He sells his inheritance. He sells his property and a kinsman, a near kinsman could come. Actually, we all know that at the end of 50 years, that property would return to the family because of the year of Jubilee. But say it's just in the 20th year, and there's 30 more years before that property will go back to the original uh, owners. A kinsman redeemer, a close relative can come and purchase that land back so that it does not leave the family. So widows, slaves, and property could be redeemed. And so today, we're going to look at this shoe covenant uh, as we study uh, the book of Ruth and talk about the kinsman redeemer. So, any of you who've read the book of Ruth know it is a beautiful little book. And it says it took place in the days of the judges. Those last years of the judges were difficult years. You read the last three chapters of the book of Judges and there's a, a man who has a concubine and he gets mad at her and puts her, put, kicks her outside and, and, and that night wicked men come and abuse her all night long and kill her and then he takes a knife and cuts her into 12 pieces and sends one piece to each of the 12 tribes of Israel saying, has anything like this ever happened in Israel before? We need to do war with these guys who did this. That's the kind of stuff you're reading at the end of the book of Judges. It's, so when you come to the book of Ruth, it's like finding a gardenia in a sewer. It's like finding a rose in the desert. It's a love story. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. And so we're going to look at the book, the, the book of Ruth today. You know the story. Let me just recount it to you briefly. Famine broke loose in the land of Israel, particularly the region of Bethlehem. And a man named Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons, Malon and Chilon, uh, left the covenant land of Israel. They should have never left the covenant land, but they did. They left the covenant land of Israel and went down into the pagan land of Moab. And while they are sojourning in Moab, Malon and Chilon, the two sons, married Moabite girls, which was against Hebrew law. According to Deuteronomy 20, 25 and verse 3, a man was always to marry an Israeli. Never were they to marry Gentiles. But these two boys married Moabite girls. And then tragedy struck. Elimelech, the husband, died. Malon died. Chilon died, leaving Naomi with two Moabite daughter-in-laws. At the end of about 10 years, Naomi got word that the famine is, has diminished and things are prosperous again around the area of Bethlehem. And so she determines to return to the land of her fathers. And the two Moabite daughter-in-laws strike out to go with her. One of them turns back. But one named Ruth clings to Naomi. She says, no, I'm going with you. She's willing to leave her country. She's willing to leave her kinfolks. She leave her pagan gods and go and cast her lot with Naomi and the God of Israel. And so they return to the land. And you remember now, they're poverty stricken. They're both widows. And Naomi sends Ruth into the fields to glean. It's the time of the barley harvest. And that was a dangerous thing to do. Because in those fields you have rugged, lusty old farm boys working. And here's a beautiful young widow now out there in the open. Very dangerous. But they're, they had to take the risk. And so Ruth now goes into the fields to glean. And we read that beautiful little phrase in the scripture. She happened upon the part of the field belonging to a man named Boaz. Don't you love those, those God circumstances, those, those God coincidences? And so you know the story. Uh, he, is the close, he is close of kin. He's a kinsman redeemer. Uh, eventually they fall in love and they get married and Ruth becomes the great grandmother of King David. Praise God. Now, Let's look at the kinsman redeemer now in some detail. There are three things, uh, <clears throat> three conditions that the kinsman redeemer must fulfill. First of all, he must be a close relative. Second, he must be willing to redeem. He might be a close relative, but he not, might not be willing to redeem. And then third, 
he must have the means to redeem. He might be a close relative. He might be willing, but if he's poor, he's not going to be able to redeem anyone. So, <clears throat> let's look at this thing. He must be a close relative or a near kinsman. Go to Ruth chapter 2. As Jerry said the other night, you guys helped me preach this morning now, okay? I'm counting on you. <clears throat> I'm counting on you to help me. Praise God. Ruth chapter 2, verses beginning in verse 19. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Now, Ruth comes home from that first day, and she's met this man named Boaz. And uh, immediately, as she came to his field, she caught his eye. And so he quickly has her drawing close to him, close to his young men behind, behind the reapers, and he tells her, don't you go into any other field. I want you to stay close to me. I want you to stay with my young men. I have instructed them not to molest you. And he said, matter of fact, I have a little picnic lunch with me and we'll have lunch together. And so uh, they eat together. And when she goes home, she has a lot more grain than she would normally would have in gleaning. And when Naomi sees that amount of grain, she knows that someone has taken notice of Ruth. So, she, so in verse 19, in this second chapter, she says, And her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today, and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took, took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked, and she said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. When she says the name Boaz, Naomi suddenly perks up and realizes this is the kinsman redeemer. Praise God. She says, Blessed be the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. That word kindness is the Hebrew word hasid, the word we've talked about in all of these covenant messages. Hasid. It always has to do with covenant. It always has to do with faithfulness. It always has to do with loyalty. And so she says, we would say today, if it's New Testament, she had a Pentecostal fit. I mean, whoa, Boaz, kinsman, redeemer. God has not forgotten his covenant with us. He's loyal and he's faithful and he's committed to us even though we are widows, praise God. So Naomi said to her, the man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. Now, the word there translated nearest kin uh, is the word goel, G-O-E-L. It is a special word. It does not just mean a relative. It means the kinsman redeemer. It means the one who has the right to redeem. She says, you have stumbled upon the field of the kinsman redeemer of our family. And she said, that shows God's covenant and his faithfulness to us, praise God. And so, uh, in verse 23 it says, So she kept close to the maidens of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Now, <clears throat> so the kinsman redeemer must be a close relative. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 as we talk about our Boaz. Our kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. It says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus, likewise partook of the same nature, that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil. Now, look at all the things that are said here. Uh, in Hebrews 2 and verse 18 about our kinfolk, our kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus. Uh, let me turn to, to Hebrews here. It says, Since therefore the children share, sh children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same nature, 
flesh and blood. He partook of the same nature, flesh and blood. <clears throat> that through death he might destroy him who has the power of death and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong bondage. For surely... It is not with angels that he's concerned, but with the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered and been tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. Now you read all of that about same nature, be made like us in every respect. He suffered he was tempted and you begin to get the idea that he was human. He had to be human to be able to redeem us, to be a, our kinsman redeemer. He could not have been some distant deity who had no feeling for fallen humanity. But he must be one who has our own nature. He's one who feels our hurts. He's one who sympathizes with our weaknesses. He's one who is tempted as we are tempted. Matter of fact, he went into the desert, was tempted 40 days by the devil. Most of us have never met the head man, the devil. He's, uh, maybe he's assigned a lieutenant to us. But most of us have never dealt with the devil himself. Jesus, for 40 days, is eye to eye with the devil being tempted and yet without sin. Uh, he was misunderstood. Often he would teach something. They would take it and twist it, and it would be misunderstood. Uh, he understood what it was to be accused falsely. Can you believe this? Jesus is teaching and doing miracles and they said, oh, he's doing that by the power of Beelzebub. The power of the devil. That's awful. I remember when we started our coffee house uh, back in the 70s in San Marcos, uh, we, were, we were just reaching kids from all over the city, from the college, from the Gary Job Corps, from the high school. Kids were coming there getting saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, delivered from drugs. And the religious community in San Marcos began to spread the story that those, up there in that coffee house, that's a drug selling center. And it's a, and it's a whorehouse. That's what they were saying about us. That hurt. Falsely accused. Jesus understands that he was falsely accused. Uh, he understood slander. Did you know he always lived under the, under the cloud of being illegitimate? Why? Because his mother was pregnant before her and Joseph ever got, ever got married. And so the question is, who was really his father? He's just illegitimate. He was forsaken by those whom he had worked with for three years. He was betrayed by one of his closest friends. He was rejected. The Bible says he was despised and rejected of men. He came unto his own, the Jewish people, and they received him not. He went through tremendous pain and suffering there upon the cross. And because of all of that, praise God, he can sympathize with our weaknesses and our hurts and our failures and our shortcomings and be a merciful, praise God, high priest to us. Thank you, Jesus. You know, Beth and I went to the Baptist Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, and we had hardly moved into our little apartment. And this prissy little girl came down the alley, and I was outside, and uh, just cute as she could be. And she turns to me and she says, my daddy, she, 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 she says, my husband is in the seminary. He's a student. And she says, is your daddy in the seminary? I said, what? I said, I'm in the seminary. And I'm married too. I have a wife. Well, out of that, Bob and Claudine and Beth and I became best friends. And uh, they just lived right at our back door. And we went out to eat a lot with them, did a lot of fun things with them. And then as we graduated, we went different directions in life. And uh, many years later, Beth and I had just moved, our family had just moved to Pensacola, Florida to uh, Pastor Liberty Church there. And about the time we were moving, we did not know it. Bob and Claudine had a beautiful young girl that they had adopted. She's now 16 years old. Her name is Kimmy. Uh, we had adopted Teresa a year later, so the, 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 the mothers had fun raising those two girls. Every time we'd see each other, they'd talk about what the girls were doing and everything. And Kimmy grew up to be a 16-year-old, vivacious Christian girl, uh, many, many friends. And then one day she left the house. They lived near a railroad track. And probably like most teenagers, she had the radio going, and she doesn't hear the train coming. And the train hits her car, and she's killed. 
just absolutely devastated them. But we didn't know this had happened. Several weeks later, Bob found out where we were, that we were in Florida, and he called me. And I said, hey, how are you guys doing? He said, Jim, not good. He said, Kimmy got hit by a train and killed. I just dropped the phone. I couldn't, I couldn't fathom that. Our two girls had grown up together. And I, I, I didn't know what to say to him. I never lost a child like that. I couldn't feel what they were feeling. But I promise you there was one, there was one, a great high priest, a loving Jesus, that could understand the hurts that they felt in losing that child. So he had to be a, become a human to be a merciful high priest on our behalf. Praise God. I think we could even say he's our brother, is that right? The Bible says he's our brother. He is our kinsman redeemer, praise God. So the kinsman redeemer must be a close relative, a near kinsman. The, the, the second reason that, that Jesus had to be human was not just to be a merciful high priest so he could understand us and feel our hurts, but, and, and this one I'll not develop today, it's another, but he had to be uh, a human to, unlike the first Adam, defeat the devil. It was a man who lost everything, right? And it's going to have to be a man who regains it. And so he will come as the last Adam and the second man to regain everything that the first Adam lost when he sinned. Now, so the kinsman redeemer must be a close relative. Second, he must be willing to redeem. Now look at chapter 3 in the book of Ruth. Ruth chapter 3. He must be willing to redeem. Well, Naomi has figured out what's going on uh, between Ruth and Boaz. And so she tells her what to do. She says, you go down to the threshing floor tonight and uh, slip yourself under the edge of his cover and he'll know what to do. So it says, at midnight the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, who are you? And she, she answered, I'm Ruth, your maidservant. Spread your skirt over your maidservant, for you are next of kin. She is saying, you are the kinsman redeemer, and I want you to exercise your right as the kinsman, kin, kin, kinsman redeemer and to redeem me and Naomi. <clears throat> and he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. I'm willing. For all of my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of worth. And now it is true that I am a near kinsman. I am the Goel. I am a kinsman redeemer. Yet there is a kinsman nearer than I. Remain this night and in the morning. If he will do the part of the next of kin for you, well, let him do it. But if he is not willing to do the, next, to do the part of the next of kin for you, then as the Lord lives, I will do the part of the next of kin for you. Lie down until morning. Now, the question comes up, why hadn't Boaz already proposed to her? We know they're in love. She's been going into his field all through the barley harvest and all through the wheat harvest. And he's been bringing picnic lunch every day. And she sits down at noon with him and they, they have a, a date out to, to lunch together. And yet all these weeks, and he's never approached her about getting married. You say, why would that be? Well, maybe several reasons. Number one, there's an age difference. Boaz is of the older, an older generation. He's a generation older than Ruth. And probably he struggles with this thing about marrying this younger woman. I'm not looking at anybody. <laughs> okay, That's okay. It's all right, right, Jerry? It's all right. Uh, and then second, Naomi has the first right of redemption. Actually, it, it, when Elimelech died, the kinsman redeemer should have redeemed Naomi. 
But she, it's obvious she has given up her right of redemption because she's promoting Ruth. She's coaching Ruth on what to do. So she's, she's given up her right, and she's sending the younger one. And then third reason they might, he might have been slow in proposing is that there was a closer relative. There was a closer kinsman who has the first right of redemption. So the kinsman redeemer must be willing. So let's see now about this, this other uh, this other kinsman. See what it says about him in Ruth chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. <clears throat> and Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the next of kin of whom Boaz had spoken came. Came by, and so Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turns aside and sits down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. He wants witnesses. So they sat down. Then he said to the next of kin, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is willing to sell the parts of land which belong to our kinsman Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of these sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people, if you will redeem it. If you will redeem it, then redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you, and he said, I will redeem it. I'm willing to redeem it. So he gives the guy his chance. He says, you're a closer relative. Do you want to redeem it? And here's his response. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you are buying Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the dead, in order to restore the name of the dead to his inheritance. Then the next of kin said, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. I'm not willing to redeem it. Now, when Boaz presents to him that he can redeem the land, he says, I'll do it. I've got the money. I will redeem the land. And then Boaz says to him, now remember this, with the land comes Ruth, the Moabite widow of Malon. And immediately he says, no deal. I don't want her. Now, what he's really... This guy, I don't, he's a legalist. And he's saying, I don't want a dirty Moabite Gentile under my roof. And I'm quite sure that his thoughts are, Malon and Chilon married foreign girls. And the tragedy that comes upon their whole family of daddy dying and the two boys dying and all that they went through is because they violated Hebrew law. And I'm not about to take that woman under my roof because the same thing might happen. He is a legalist through and through. Look at Deuteronomy 23.3. This will give you an idea of what the Israelis thought about the Moabites. No Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of the Lord even to the 10th generation. None belonging to them shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever. There's the, there's the attitude toward Moabites. And he says, I am not about to take that Gentile Moabite into my house. So he, he's, he's definitely uh, a legalist. Let, let me read. Beth said, you can read all them books, Jimmy. I, uh, just a little bit of one. I'm, this book is called Explore the Book by J. Sidlow Baxter. If you want a good book... Uh, a single volume commentary that deals with the issues of every book in the Bible. This is a, really a good one. Uh, so J Sidlow Baxter asked this question, but who is that unnamed kinsman who would not redeem? He wasn't willing to redeem. I think the answer may be suggested to us if we read over again the words which occur in Deuteronomy 23.3 about no Moabite can come into the assembly of the Lord even to the 10th generation. The unnamed and unwilling kinsman in Ruth 4.6 is a picture of the law. The law in itself is just, but it has no smile, no place, no welcome for alien Ruth. The unnamed kinsman would have paid the price for the estate of Elimelech 
if that had been all there was to think, to think of. But as soon as he heard that Moabitess Ruth was involved, he refused. Listen to this. The law can do nothing for us as sinners and spiritual aliens to God. It cannot forgive. It cannot cleanse. It cannot renew. It cannot empower. It can only condemn us. Thank God. The Moabite who is shut out by law is admitted by grace. Praise God. Whoa. Man, if I don't light your fire, your wood is wet, I tell you. Man. Whew. Praise God. So, Jesus, our Boaz, was so willing to redeem us and marry us. Amen. Amen. Galatians 4, 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Can you just see that conversation in heaven as the father turns to Jesus after so many centuries have passed since Adam's sin. He says, son, it's time for you to go and get our kids back. And Jesus says, he doesn't say, oh man, that's going to be painful, that's going to be hard. He says, I'll go, daddy. And so he comes into the world and in John 10, 18, he says, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. I willingly lay it down. So he is our kinsman redeemer, our Boaz, who is willing to redeem us. And the good news is, it doesn't matter if you're a Moabite, an Israelite, an American, a Canadian, a Hispanic, red, yellow, black, or white. He came, praise God, willing to redeem every one of us and buy us back. Praise God. Now, let's just remember this little thought. We need to be willing servants also. Not just out of duty. But willing servants, our will must be to do His will, praise God. Amen. Just like Jesus. And then the third thing about the kinsman redeemer, he must have the means to redeem. Now obviously, Boaz had the means to redeem. He's wealthy. You read the story, and th this guy's the boss. He runs the operation there in, in, the, in the harvest fields. So he's got plenty of money to redeem Ruth. And the property. Now, did Jesus have the means to redeem? Amen. Did he have the goods? Amen. Praise God. Look in, look in uh, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. It says, you know that you were ransomed. That's the word for redeemed. You were redeemed from the feudal ways inherited from your fathers. Not with perishable things such as silver or gold but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Praise God. So it was with his precious blood that he redeemed us and brought us back to God. L listen to me carefully here. Your name is Ruth. My name is Ruth. We were Gentile sinners outside the covenant family of Israel. Look, look, look what it says in, in in second chapter of Ephesians about Gentiles. Ephesians chapter 2. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh call the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands. Now look here, here describes the Gentiles. Listen to this. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Second, alienated from the commonwealth or citizenship of Israel. Third, Strangers to the covenants of promise. Fourth, having no hope and fifth without God in the world. That's who we were. Our name was Ruth. Alien, Gentile, Moabite, sinners. But Jesus, with his precious blood, came and redeemed us. Redeemed us. Back to the family. Praise God. That's so good. Now let me finish up by talking about something that most of you probably have never heard before. I want to talk now about the redemption of the land. Go to Ruth chapter 4, verse 7 through 11. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other. And this was the manner of attesting in Israel. 
So when the next of kin said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged <coughs> to Chilon and to Malon. And also Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead and his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from the, <coughs> and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together build up the house of Israel. May you prosper in Ephrath and be renowned in Bethlehem. Wow, praise God. Now, notice in our story that Boaz not only redeemed Ruth, he redeemed what? The land, right? The property. Now, when I was reading this story, a long time ago I was reading it, and this shoe covenant deal. Oh, I better stay out of there. This, this side's okay. I'll get over. No, we're not. We're not over here. <laughs> Got me hemmed in, Jerry. I can't, I can't run. Anyway, this shoe covenant, when this one took off that shoe, and hand it to Boaz. He was saying, this is no longer my land. I cannot walk on it. I cannot stand on it in authority. It now belongs to you. And that struck me. Wow, the shoe, yeah. He can't walk on that land anymore. He can't stand on that land anymore. He can't stand in authority anymore because it's not his. And if he enters that land, he's trespassing, right? Praise God. Well, Jesus came to redeem us and our land, the earth. Psalm 115, verse 16, The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth He has given to the sons of men. That's our home. That's our property. <clears throat> now, we know what happened. Our ancestor Adam, who was a king over all the earth, he had authority over everything in the earth, but he betrayed that authority to the devil when he sinned, right? He handed, over, he handed the title deed of the earth over to the devil. And the moment the devil got the title deed to the earth, the earth came under a curse. Everything that Satan puts his fingerprint on will be cursed. Always remember that. It will be cursed. There's not anything good in him. So the earth comes under a curse. The soil becomes cursed. It's no longer fertile. So that God says to Adam, now the earth is no longer fertile. You're going to have to, by the sweat of your brow, raise crops from the earth. It's going to be hard to do. So the soil is cursed. The plant life is cursed. God says, now it'll produce thorns and thistles. This is all in Genesis 3, right? It'll produce thorns and thistles. Thistles, simply meaning that from here on, it's easier to grow weeds than it is to grow wheat. The plant life comes under a curse. The animal life comes under a curse and becomes violent. And now lions kill little gazelles and wolves eat sheep. That was not so before the fall. So the earth comes under a curse. But well, would you agree with me here that in the victory of the cross, Jesus redeemed us and he redeemed the earth. Let's say it this way. Jesus has the shoe. Amen. He's got the shoe to the earth. Praise God. Whoa. And now you say, but yet, yet wait a minute, Brother Jimmy. We still, these, we still see the effects of the curse. We still had to put fertilizer in the soil to make it Productive. Uh, it'll still grow mesquites. And there's still deserts. Unproductive deserts. The animal kingdom is still violent. 
True? Let me show you something, though. Look in Romans 8, verses 18 through 22. The apostle is writing here, and he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. It came under a curse. Not of its own will, but by the will of Him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay. Catch those phrases. And obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. Oh, look at all that. Creation is groaning. It's, it's groaning under this burden of the curse. And it's wanting to come into its the liberty, freedom, redemption of the sons of God. You see, why hadn't that happened yet, Brother Jimmy? If Jesus redeemed us and the earth, why do we still have curse upon the earth? Well, it's a matter of timing in God. Think about our redemption. Do you believe on the cross Jesus redeemed us, spirit, soul, and body? Amen. Amen. He did. But the redemption of our bodies is yet future. Is that right? It's yet future. Because the, the I mean, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus redeemed us. Yet the redemption of our bodies is still in the future. And so... The, the final salvation, the final redemption of our bodies will not come until the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes from heaven with all with Him, those who have gone on and fallen asleep in the Lord. He brings them with Him and at that time, moment, the dead in Christ shall rise with new bodies, redeemed bodies, amen, and be joined to their spiritual beings. And that generation of Christians who are still alive, still under a body that has not been fully redeemed, that generation in the twinkling of an eye will put off that old mortal and put on immortality. And then shall we be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with Him. Amen. That, so you see, there's a time gap between when Jesus purchased it and when it will become full effect. Already been 2,000 years. Now, here we go again. Watch this. Now we as the church are in heaven. We've been raptured out. Got, on, got our new redeemed bodies. And then there's the, the beam of the beam of judgment, the seat of Christ, where we're going to receive our rewards, amen, in heaven. And then we're going to go to a marriage, a feast, and get married to Jesus, amen. All that is happening in heaven, but out on earth it ain't so good. Seven years of tribulation, seven years of judgment, seven years of the wrath of God being poured out upon unbelieving man. And then at the end of those seven years, praise God, Jesus will come again. This time it's not a silent coming like at the rapture. Every eye shall see Him. He'll come again. And He'll bring His warrior bride with Him. We're coming with Him. And we're going to whip up on the Antichrist and the false prophet in the battle of Armageddon. We're going to defeat Him utterly with our King, the Lord Jesus. And the false prophet and the Antichrist will be thrown into the lake of fire forever. And the old devil will be chained and thrown into a pit for a thousand years. Amen. Praise God. Woo! And then begins a thousand year reign we call the millennium. And Jesus will sit up on the throne of His father David in Jerusalem, reigning over the nation of Israel and over the nations of the earth. But here's what, something else that will happen. During that thousand years, there will be an unveiling of earth's redemption. Let me read from Dr. DeHaan's book. This is so good. He says, God never made a desert. He pronounces creation good. Deserts are the result of the curse upon the ground. But when the Redeemer comes, the entire earth will become once more like the Garden of Eden. So productive will the earth be in the day, and that day that the prophet Amos describes it as follows. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper. And the treader of gapes, him that soweth seed. They'll hardly get through with one harvest and the other one's coming right in behind it. The earth will become so productive. He says the curse will be removed. The earth will bring forth her increase and there will be plenty for all. The animal creation shall also share in the deliverance of the Redeemer. 
Isaiah declares in his prophecy, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. And the lion shall eat straw like an ox. That's Isaiah 65, 25. <clears throat> and here's what Dehan says. This aspect of redemption is often forgotten by Bible students. We limit the work of Christ as though it consisted only of redeeming man, men and women from hell and destruction. But Christ died to redeem the earth and the creatures as well as mankind. Whoa. When Jesus reigns, this is talking about in the millennium, the earth will be like paradise before the fall. And so during that thousand years, nature will be changed. It won't be grown in anymore. It will be utterly changed. And we shall reign with him for a thousand years. It actually says in, in Isaiah that if somebody dies a hundred years old, we say, man, he died young. He's just a kid. That's how productive life will be upon the earth during that thousand years because it's been redeemed. He came to redeem us and he came to redeem our house, amen, our property, the earth. Praise the Lord. Well, if that don't make you love Jesus more, you've got a problem. Amen. Amen. We love him. We love him. Our great kinsman redeemer, our brother, one of same nature as us who feels our hurts, one who was willing to lay down his life that we could be redeemed and who, praise God, he had the, he had the, he had the goods to do it. He had his own precious sinless blood by which he redeemed all mankind. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Those of you who are watching by streaming today, television in your living rooms, I've talked about our wonderful Boaz, our precious kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus. And if you have never bowed the knee to him, today would be a good day to do it. Anyone in this, in this auditorium this morning, anyone watching this by line, this would be a good day to bow the knee to Jesus, your kinsman redeemer. Praise God. Only he could have redeemed us. He had to be human. He had to be willing. And he had to have the goods to do it. His own precious blood. So today, bow the knee and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'll walk with you. I'll follow you. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you for coming into my life. Thank you for becoming my king. I'll follow you all the days of my life. Make that decision this morning. It'll be the greatest decision that you have ever made. Amen. Praise God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Praise the Lord. I don't know who this invisible guy is over here, but I'm going to cut him off. If I was a betting man, I'd be willing to bet almost anything I got that there's not anybody here today that's sorry they came. Amen? Hallelujah. Um, we uh, started last week uh, taking up a benevolence offering. We have some folks that are in some dire straits, and you guys did really, really good last week. We had a nice offering, but we need a little bit more, and, and we agreed that we'd do it two Sundays. So I should have announced it earlier so you could think about it a little more. But if you just ask God what he wants you to give, then we'll come out with enough to help a couple of families. So I hope that you all will take that seriously and, and help us out and help them out. Because it's, it's a season to, to give. Amen? And, and you guys have always been great givers. So are you glad you came to church? How about you folks out in streaming land? Are y'all glad y'all tuned in? And I hope you got something out of it. Man, that was a good message, Pastor Jimmy. I like that. Makes, makes me ready to go. <laughs> Amen. So, anyway, uh, how many of y'all are going to uh, perform at the talent show for New Year's Eve? I'm looking for hands. Stand up if you're gonna if you're serious and you're gonna do something. One, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven. Amen. Is that a no? Back there, is that a no? <laughs> You're not answering me. Anyway, uh, if you know somebody that, that has something they can share with us, invite them to come with you, okay? And, uh, and sign up out there. Let us know how many we'll have. There's the sign-up sheet right there. Put your name on it so we can kind of plan and know how many we got coming. And, and we're going to get D to put out an all-points bulletin tomorrow. And, and let everybody know that they need to be here and they need to be ready to perform. And you don't have to be good. You can just do, you can, tell, you can have a poem, you can tell a joke as long as it's clean. And, uh, and, and you can just strut your stuff, okay? So, all right. Are we ready to go home? How do you know when you've been to a cowboy church? What's he say, Jimmy? Y'all come back now, you hear? Soon. New Year's Eve night.